Okay, nice to have you all here this evening. Let's begin singing hymn number 455. In my heart there rings a melody. That's a good one to start with. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary. For he washed my sins away. He put me within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Twill be my endless theme in glory. With the angels I will sing, twill be a song with glorious harmony when the courts of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Very, very good okay in terms of announcements they're basic we'll meet again here at nine o'clock a.m for a covid sensitive uh time uh, the regulation service at nine o'clock then or sunday morning of course uh 10 a.m begins our sunday school hour and morning worship after we all know that six o'clock p.m and uh in other terms of other things that i guess i should make mention of children are treasure but you got this probably in sunday's uh mem uh bulletin and there's a couple of people that are expecting children very soon and they probably need a few things to start that off with because i know they'll need it i know of one thing they will definitely need and we could all vote on that and know what that is so that's something we can certainly do so keep that in prayer that's at 2 p.m on the 13th of february coming up pretty soon here time does go by in a hurry doesn't it okay uh I don't know of anything else. Probably, maybe Pastor will mention something. But before Pastor comes and speaks, let's turn to 166 and sing a beautiful song, Cleanse Me. Self and pride, I now 
surrender, Lord, in me abide. Oh, Holy Ghost, revival comes from Thee. Send a revival, start the work in me. It's a good prayer for all of us. Amen. Pastor. Well, good evening. It's good to see each one of you here tonight, and I hope that you are well. Uh, we are going to be in John chapter 3 and verse 21 this evening, if you'd like to turn there with me. John chapter 3 and verse 21. We'll have our time of uh, Bible study, and then we'll go to our time of prayer this evening. There are many who still need to bring before the Lord for health and healing, and so we'll uh, commit them to the Lord and any other requests uh, when we come to pray later. But John chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading verse 18, and we'll just go down to verse 21. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. We'll end our reading there, and then let's just pray, and we'll uh, commit our study to the Lord and ask for His help. Father in heaven, we thank you for this night. We thank you that we can gather here and praise your name. We thank you that we can spend this time in your word. Lord, may we never take for granted the fact that we have uh, this perfect revelation of truth that tells us all we need to know about you and ourselves, about our sin and our Savior. We pray you'd help us to understand that which we look at this evening, and that in all things you may be glorified. This we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This evening, our focus as we look through uh, verses 19 through 21, and 21 in particular, is to consider the subject of truth. Now, this is not because I spent the last two days dealing with used car salesmen, who seem to have a very loose grip on the truth. It has been... I always knew used car salesmen had a bad reputation, and I never doubted it, uh, but the ones I met in the last 24 hours have certainly reinforced the bad reputation that some of them have. Uh, I am very grateful and, uh, you know, very, very grateful uh, for Zach's help. He helped me to steer through the, the lies and the deception and the darkness and uh, the villains that are out there in the car world. And uh, I'd be in a lot of trouble if he hadn't been with me. So I praise the Lord for that. Um, I'm not bitter, uh, but used car salesman may come up a few times this evening. <laughs> I'll save the turkey story for another day. <laughs> yeah, the, the turkey story, that will have to come back on a, another, uh, another day maybe. But when we look through this portion of Scripture, it speaks in, in verse 19 uh, of the light. It says, this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And one aspect of light is, is that it's truth. It reveals. You can't hide from the light once it's being shined. And the truth is the same way. The truth reveals the darkness. The truth reveals error. When you get to verse 20, he says, Everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And so those who are committing wickedness, those who are disobeying God and are disobeying the truth, they try and stay away from the light. They try and scuttle away from it. If you think of the way that uh, cockroaches, if you've ever been anywhere that's had an abundance of cockroaches, then you can go into a room, turn on a light, and see them scatter. And when I stayed with some of uh, some family in New York City several years ago, you would literally see it. You turn on a light, and then they would just dart into the corners of the kitchen. It was a very, very uncomfortable place to be. And that is the way those who do evil 
evil behave. They want to get away from the light. Those in error, those who uh, do not like the truth or want to accept the truth, will scutter and scuttle into the darkness. But then in verse 21, it says, He that doeth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And so we want to just break down each phrase in verse 21 this evening and think about what it means and what we can learn from it. Because we live in times uh, that do not acknowledge the truth. We live in times where people no longer accept that there is such a thing as, as antithesis. Antithesis means that there is right and wrong. There is pro and con. So, you know, if I say that the carpet's red and somebody else says it's blue, a third person can't turn around and say, well, that's okay, you're both right. You know, it's either red or it's not. Now, I understand there's shades of color and there can be disagreement on it, but if something is quantifiably red, if you can put it under, you know, special equipment and you can check that which spectrum of light it falls into, it is provably one thing and not another. And yet we live in times where people want to be able to say, well, you know, it's red to you, it's blue to someone else, and that's okay, you can both be right. And when it comes to the color of the carpet, you know, that can generate quite a lot of conversation. But the problems really come when we speak about the truth of who we are, where we've come from. Why are we here? Are we sinners or is everybody just basically okay? Does everybody go to heaven? Is there a heaven? People are very confused because they deny basic truths. About 15 years ago, the, the BBC back in the United Kingdom did a survey and they found that something like 78% of people uh, believed that when they died, they would go to heaven. But only about 60% of people believed that there was life after death. And so people like the idea of heaven and wanting to to go there, but fewer people believed in it that said they were going. You know, and people don't care about truth. And so it makes it very, very difficult uh, for us as Christians and in many different arenas in life. It explains why there are so many glaring inconsistencies in what you see in the media and in movies and different things uh, as you go through life. So we want to think about truth this evening as we have it in the Word of God. So the first phrase there, he says that he that does truth, he that doeth truth. And this is where we are kind of beginning with that foundation that there is truth. That's the assumption that is made here, that there is truth. There is light. There is something that is quantifiably right. You know, if we go to the end of John to chapter 18 and verse 38... John chapter 18 and verse 38, Pilate is judging Jesus. And now if we go back, sorry, let's go back to verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, and to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. You know, it's striking that living in a period of time when many, many people deny the existence of truth, it's denying one of the primary reasons that Jesus came into the world. He says, I came into the world to bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate says unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again into the, unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Pilate, along with many Romans, were in a similar culture where they wanted to deny the existence of truth because as soon as you acknowledge truth, it makes demands on you. And so Pilate uh, there, instead of investigating what the truth of Jesus Christ was, he, he wants to seemingly have a philosophical discussion. What is truth? You know, who can know? We're all on a journey. We're all pilgrims. You know, who can be sure of anything? Jesus said, I am a witness to the truth. And in Jesus Christ, we share in that truth is uh, that which is right, that which is correct. It, it ties into that word integrity. Truth is the absence of error. In First John chapter 1, verse 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if there is darkness, if there is error, we're not living according to the truth. Truth and living according to it means there is an absence of error. It could be simple just to quote John 14 verse 6 where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we build from that foundation. 
What does that mean? Well, that means that what Jesus said is truth, we believe. The Word of God. How does the Word of God begin? It begins with saying that God created us. It begins by saying that because of sin, we're all separated from Him. It continues to explain and demonstrate that through Jesus Christ, we can be reunited with God. It tells us how we can live lives of godliness and honesty in this world. You know, the, the one truth leads to another. But the difficult thing with truth is that, as I mentioned a moment ago, it can challenge us. It will change us. It reveals our error. In Proverbs 20, verse 27, it says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. The spirit of man is, is that part of us where we have conscience, we have awareness. It's one of those things that makes us different from the animals that are in the rest of the world. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. There is that aspect of conscience, that part of us which tells us when we have done wrong. And although it can be seared, it can be something that over time we can learn to ignore, it is something that we all begin with. In Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is arguing for the existence of the conscience. And in verse 14, he says, When the Gentiles, which have not the law, speaking of the law of Moses, which was given to Israel, he says, When they do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Paul kind of uses the word law interchangeably there with several things. And he says, you know, Gentiles, they don't have the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments and everything else. He says, but they inherently know that murder is wrong, that theft is wrong, that there are certain things that are not right. And he says they show that there is a law that's at work in their own minds, and that's their conscience, that God-given awareness. And like I said, people can learn to ignore it, but ultimately is there. And so that truth that reveals our error, we have a responsibility to respond to it correctly. In James 1 verse 23, it says, For if any be a hearer of the word, a hearer of truth, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. And he goes on to say, he's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and sees something that's wrong and then goes away and doesn't uh, doesn't do anything about it, doesn't correct what he sees is wrong. James 1 verse 24 continues, you see, no, wrong chapter. Yeah, for he beholding himself goes his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. It's like someone who looks in a mirror, they see there's something there that they need to put right, and then they walk away without making any change. You know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, one of the, the crazy laws that the Pharisees added to the Old Testament was this. In the Old Testament, one of the laws was to keep the Sabbath. And the Pharisees took it to a, an insane uh, degree. And they made a law that on the Sabbath, women, and they targeted women for some reason, I don't know why, they said women weren't allowed to look in a mirror. Because if they saw something they didn't like about themselves, they would change it and that was work. And, you know, why they picked on women, I don't know. But you see the example that he's given. He's saying, you know, if you look in a mirror, you see something you want to change, you do something about it. He says, we, when we look into God's word, it acts like a mirror. It shows us what we should be, but it also reveals what we are. And so when we, when we do truth, when we observe truth and obey truth, as John speaks about it in John 3, 21, when we look at what we ought to be compared to what we are, we change. And that's one of the difficult things that many people have with truth. You know, I've mentioned before that, you know, many people are looking for, you know, some kind of utopia. And in utopia, you can't have anyone who is, is wrong, who is sinful. Sin can't exist because if something's wrong, you have to deal with it. And that acknowledges that you're not in any kind of a utopia. And because they know you cannot get rid of that which is wrong, they deny that wrong exists. Well, then who's the problem? The stubborn people who turn around and say, well, no, there is such a thing as right and wrong. You know, they want to say, we, we, we're going to set up a perfect society. And they see that there is no perfection, so they deny things are wrong, and then you and I become the problem. 
the problem with truth is that it reveals where people need to change. There's a fear of truth. Change can sometimes mean difficulty. You know, I know that there is that truth, that a lack of exercise is unhealthy, it's not good for me. The truth is that I need to change and begin to exercise. And that can be a difficult thing. When the Word of God reveals something about ourselves, when the Bible says, thou, you know, you should not lie, or you should honor your father and mother, and then there's something in my conscience that says, you know what, I, I didn't treat my parents properly in this thing, I need to put it right. That is truth demanding a change. When we do truth, when we are observing truth, then we respond to it in submission. We acknowledge that there is such a thing. We acknowledge where we're wrong, and we choose to obey. Uh, if we look for a moment at First Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, Peter commends his readers. He says, Seeing you have purified your souls and obey in the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. He says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. And then he goes on to build on it and talks about their love for one another and what their behavior ought to be. He's speaking there of the truth of the gospel, which we know. The truth changes us. And in John chapter 3 verse 21, it says, He that does truth, he that doeth truth, obeys truth, and responds to it obediently, comes to the light. You have no fear. You have no uh, concern about being seen by God or acknowledging that God knows what you're doing and saying and thinking. Because you're living according to truth. You're living in the light. You're not afraid of the light. You want to go to the light. You, you see the benefit of it. And you want to, to have a greater light in your life. And there are many blessings to embrace in truth. One of those blessings is that in truth there is no fear. First John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. When we have embraced the truth of the gospel, as Peter talked about, we've come to the light, we're embracing that truth, we're in his love. We've responded to his love, and Romans chapter uh, 5 says that the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts. Romans 5 verse 8 describes God's love as being poured into us and overflowing from us. And in that love, in that truth, there is no fear. Now, there will be times where maybe anxiety creeps in. You know, there may be times when there are fears that begin to take over, and sometimes it's a sudden irrational thing. I remember once flying, I think it was in 1998, I was flying over to look at some Bible colleges in South Carolina, North Carolina, and I remember falling asleep on the plane, and then I woke up terrified with the thought, we are 30,000 feet up in the air in a big tin can. This is insane. And for a moment, I was really afraid of flying, and then I settled down, and, you know, it was fine. You know, some fears just kind of come on us, you know, irrationally, and we deal with it and we move on. There are other fears that maybe uh, they return to us. You know, we deal with it. We cast our cares on the Lord. He gives us peace, and then a little while later, we begin to get anxious about something again. And we need to give that back to the Lord. But we're, when we're living in that truth that God is God, that he's all-powerful, that he's good, that he hears our prayers, just with those basic foundations, we have reason to not fear. Now, it's not based upon the truth that we can understand everything God is doing, because that's not a truth, is it? We can't know everything God is doing. And the, the truck that I, we were eventually able to, to buy and drive up, I was listening to the radio and Joel Osteen came on. And I thought, well, I'll listen to it for a moment. And there were some of the things that he was saying that I just thought it was given false hope to people. It was given a false expectation. We need to make sure the truth that we speak is, is based upon the Word of God. You know, I can't comfort you with the truth 
you will understand everything that God is doing because that's simply not true. There are many things in our lives where God brings us to a difficult time. He gives us the grace to go through it, and we may have to then just trust him that he knew what he was doing. Sometimes God reveals it. Sometimes God makes it clear. I mentioned my pastor, Tom Dotson, before, how once he was on his way to preach at another church, and this was down in northeast Georgia, and he forgot his Bible. He'd asked one of his kids to pick it up for him. They'd forgot it, and so he's hard halfway to this church, realizes he doesn't have his Bible, which is, you know, not a comfortable place as a preacher to be. And occasionally I do that. I come up, I sit down here, and then I realize I don't have my Bible or notes or anything, and I get up and I kind of go back out quickly and then come back in. Um, And, you know, never think that if I forget my notes, it's going to mean a shorter message. If I have my notes, if you look, there's a final page. Or I turn it over and I'm done. If I have no sermon notes, there's no last page. I can just keep going. But Pastor Dodson, he had to turn around. He went back, picked up his Bible, and then he's rushing to try and get back to this church on time. And when he got back to a certain point, they found that there were trees across the road. There was just devastation that hadn't been there before. And he comes to find out that a tornado had just passed through that way. And he said, you know, I can't prove it, but I wonder if the Lord allowed me to forget my Bible. So I turn around, go back and then have to go and, you know, and I miss the tornado. Now, sometimes the Lord gives us a bit of insight and we think, okay, maybe I can see a reason for this happening. Other times we may not know. But the truth that God is God, that he's good, that he loves us and he hears our prayers, these are things that we can be certain of. And so in that, we can have peace. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that phrase, sound mind, it has an understanding of, of teaching, of doctrine, of soundness. Some used car salesman will tell you that the car is sound that you're looking at, that there's no rust, but you go to it and begin to poke it and bits fall out. It's not sound. It's not strong. It's not stable. When we're in the love of God, when we're resting in his truth, when we have come to the light, there is a blessing of not having to fear, of not having to be anxious, and of not having anything to hide. Of not thinking, well, I hope they don't look behind, you know, this thing because there's going to see there's something wrong with the car. You know, one of the cars we went to look at, I'm not using all my examples. I'll save some of them for another day, but it's coming up. One of the cars, the trucks we went to look at, we got there early and the guy who was meant to meet us was off somewhere else with the truck we were meant to be looking at. And the other guy there was showing us some pictures that the first man hadn't. His name was Carlos. It's ever burned into my mind. And... Carlos had gone off to get these covers that go over the wheel wells. And what the other guy was showing us, well, there was like big spots of rust all around it. So Carlos eventually comes back and he tells us, yeah, I was away. We were just getting these, you know, wheel covers on. It's something we do all the trucks. There's no rust there. And we were like, we didn't say anything. We were like, well, your friend just showed us pictures of it. You know, there's definitely rust there. He wasn't in truth. He was trying to cover it up. But it was found out. There was another place we went to, and there were a couple of issues with with the truck already. But when Zach looked underneath, he says, if you look down, you can see they've spray painted it to cover up the rust. And the guy came out, and he said that, um, you know, I'm glad I had Zach. Like, the guy came out, and he said, do you want a closer look? And Zach was like, no, you spray painted it. It's, you know, basically saying it's junk. You know, you lied. And um, the guy was like, oh, no, we didn't do that. that. It was given to us that way. And we'd already looked at another vehicle that had also been spray painted. And I, you know, we kind of felt like saying, did you get that one from the same person? Because they spray painted that one as well. They do all these things to cover up the error, to cover up something that is wrong. But you know, if you're in the truth, you have nothing to hide. If you are doing what is right, when you go back to the Garden of Eden, what's the very first thing that Adam and Eve did when they had sinned and God came to meet with them in the cool of the day? They hid themselves. But when you're in the truth, there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to be anxious over or nothing to fear. 
In fact, truth rejoices, or the truth rejoices in the light, in the existence of truth. In 1 Corinthians 13, 6, describing the love of God, it says that it rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. A further blessing of being in the truth and embracing truth is that one truth leads to another. If you embrace the truth that the Bible is the Word of God, then it opens up to you all of the truth of God. It opens up to you all the blessings of the Word. If you open up the the blessing of friendship, if you understand the biblical foundations of what good friendship is, then, you know, in Proverbs 27, 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, when you understand how friendship can be, you know, used in a positive way, and even in the conveying of something that they may not want to hear, because it's done in a spirit of love, it's something which is good. There's a group of pastors that um, we just chat backwards and forwards, and we're in a group chat, uh, and one of them said something the other day to me, and it was nothing serious, but he said something, and then he quoted this verse. He said, remember, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And then like three or four of the others piled on and said, you should have done that in public. You should have, you know, said it to him privately. And then they all started discussing exactly the, the, the theological basis of what this verse meant. And it was very entertaining. I just kind of sat back because I kind of agreed with him. And I said, yeah, you make a good point, and I acknowledge that. And so they all came on and said, look how kind and gracious he was in responding to you, and you were so mean, and, you know, it was, uh, I enjoyed it. But if you embrace the fact that there is such a thing as truth, and that in that truth you can know the genuine love of God, then you can go to one another and say, look, I love you, and you know that, you know, and I want you to understand that there's something I'm concerned, I'm concerned about. You know, I've seen this thing, and I think we need to talk. You know, this is what God's Word says, but this is what I'm seeing in your life. And, you know, that's admonition. That's biblical encouragement. And that's what this friend was doing, you know. And we have a truth that leads to truth. One truth leads to another truth, and so on it goes. John 3.21 continues, He that doeth truth, he that does truth, comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest. It is a wonderful truth, and also a fearful truth, that God is our judge. You know, 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us, Study to show thyself approved unto God. There are many people in our lives that... We want to know they approve of us. We, we want to be accepted, don't we? we? We want to have people like us. But ultimately, we need to realize that when it comes to the study of the Word of God and the study of truth, we are to seek God's approval. It is in His eyes that it truly matters whether we are right or wrong, and we have to respect His judgment. In Acts 5, verse 29, Peter and the other apostles respond to the judgment that was being put upon them by saying this, we ought to obey God rather than men. And that's a truth that we can settle on, that God is our judge. He is ultimately the one to whom we answer, and so we ought to obey God rather than men. And when we think of Him as being our judge, you know, we need to think of it as the fact that our lives are an open book. You know, my kids love reading and they found out as they started to read more and more books and more and more detailed books that you know you get books that lead and you get like a whole series of them and they found the frustration of getting to the last book in the series and finding out that there's nothing more to read about that imaginary world that they've been finding out about and they want to know more they want to know more about the characters but there's nothing else there the author didn't reveal anything else in our lives, there's nothing that is hid. It's not that God looks into our life and sees little bits of it, and, you know, there's elements that are hidden from Him and never revealed. Our lives are an open book, and everything about ourselves, our thoughts and deeds and actions, you know, everything is revealed to Him. But when we're living in the truth, we will embrace the opportunity to come before Him that our deeds may be made manifest. I think in the context of John 3, we have to realize that there is the thought there of salvation. 
And what a wonderful thing it is that because we've trusted Christ as our Savior, that we have received the righteousness of Christ and we are clothed in that righteousness. So when God looks at us, he no longer sees our sin, but he sees the righteousness of his Son. And that's why we can see as we obey the word, as we live in that light that's been given to us, that he that doeth truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Our actions are approved of God. They are done in the power of God. Living as we do, as I said, in times when there are those who not only want to argue which truth they need to acknowledge and obey, but they deny that even truth exists. We as believers need to stand that much more strongly upon the fact that truth exists and is revealed in God's word. That Jesus is the way, the life, and the truth. That God's word is truth. Jesus said in John 17 that we are cleansed by his word. His word is that truth which cleanses us, which makes us whole. It seems like it's going to be a battle which is going to rage on for some time. And so we need to be determined to stand, to claim God's truth, to live according to his truth, to enjoy the blessings of his truth and share that truth with others. Let's just close with a word of prayer and then we'll go to our praises and prayer requests. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word. And we just ask that as we... uh, apply it to our lives we would do so by your grace and strength that you would help us to live in such a way that's pleasing to you we can't do it on our own strength we can't do it without your 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 empowering grace and so we look to you to work in us and through us father i pray you would bless i believe in and expecting you to do great things for your namesake let's i ask in jesus holy name amen